Hi, Todd Vandenberg here with Vandenberg Capital Management and another Uncommon Sense update. So last night, President Biden gave us a State of the Union address. And, um, you know, as presidents are wont to do, um, he painted a pretty rosy picture of, you know, what he believes his administration has accomplished and what he thinks should be done. And it's pretty normal. I mean, every president since I've been alive that gives a State of the Union um paints a picture that maybe has a tenuous grasp on reality and yeah and that's okay i mean you know it, it it's their presentation they get to slant it any way they want what's a little disappointing uh is that the new norm seems to be that the people in the room uh seem to think that it's okay to heckle the president uh as he's making his presentation or his speech and i just wish that would stop you know just let whoever the president is democrat or republican say what they want to say and, you know, then go, you know, shake hands and, and get on with the rest of their administration. Um, but, you know, that may not happen. It just would be nice. But I digress. Uh, what I actually wanted to talk about today is a couple of things from the State of the Union and one not. Um, uh, the first one is, you know, the deficit. So the president talked about, you know, how his administration has reduced the deficit more than any other administration in the history of the country. And, uh, you know, uh, that's sort of technically true, but the only reason that the deficit uh, has been reduced, it's still higher than the average of the, um, you know, the, the 10 years preceding this administration. Um, but it's been lowered because during the pandemic, the federal government, both Democrats and Republicans, passed bills that spent trillions and trillions of, of dollars more than they brought in in revenue. And so, you know, you really had no choice but to reduce the deficit by historic amounts. Um, and so, yeah, but, but, but the deficit is still real. It still is larger today on average uh, than it has been, you know, in, in years past, other than during the financial crisis when we had a little hiccup um, in the uh, annual deficit. So um, what we need to do is we need to be hoping and, and, and communicating with our elected officials to try to get them to actually start taking you know, um, spending seriously because this deficit spending is, is, is part of what has caused inflation and it's just a drag on the economy because you know, the government cannot spend money that it doesn't tax from us or borrow from us or from you know, uh, other countries. So uh, that's the, the deficit, um, you know, the, the national debt also becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Uh, you know, we're over $31 trillion in debt. It's hard to even say that number. Um, but you know, the actual amount of debt is not what troubles me. What troubles me is uh, this chart I'm gonna show you right now is that the interest that we're paying on our debt is starting to accelerate you know, pretty dramatically. And if you just look over the last couple of years since the pandemic, as interest rates have continued to rise, um, you know, the amount of money that we pay as interest on our debt will just continue to rise because any new debt that we take on to pay off old debt, we're probably gonna be refinancing it at higher rates. And that hasn't been true for most of the last 10 years you know, as interest rates were at zero, you know, since the financial crisis, when the federal government went to go, you know, refinance its debt from prior generations, it might be refinancing something that, that they borrowed at six or seven or higher percent and refinancing it at two. And so, you know, the actual cost of, of that debt went down substantially, but we're on the opposite side of that equation now. We had, you know, almost 14 years of, of next to no uh, interest rate. And so the, the federal government was borrowing money at really, really low rates. And now as that debt comes uh, to maturity, they're having to refinance it at two and three times uh, what they had originally uh, borrowed it at. So uh, that can be a problem. And, and we've got to watch that too, because again, you know, uh, go government borrowing, if they just keep borrowing to you know, to pay the interest on prior borrowed money. This is just, it's a vicious cycle that, um, you know, becomes very difficult to dig ourselves out of. We're not at a point where, you know, we can't dig ourselves out of it. 
but it's definitely uh, a real problem. Uh, the second thing that the president talked about that I wanted to touch on has to do with, you know, he made mention of, you know, there's some people in the House here that want to, you know, sunset Social Security and Medicare. And then, you know, the hecklers went on for a few minutes and those, it was, it was ridiculous. But again, I digress. Um, the, the point behind, um, you know, what, what he was saying is that the Social Security trustees have said that, the Social Security Trust Fund uh, is, is running out of money. And, and they produced a report. Their last report was for 2022. They haven't, uh, um, they haven't updated it this year, and they won't for quite a while. But it, it basically says that, you know, by I think it's 2034, at that point, Social Security as, 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 a, as an enterprise is insolvent. Um, and... And that's a very real problem. Now, many people watching this update are, you know, too young to, to remember, you know, when President Reagan was in office and the Speaker of the House back then was Tip O'Neill. And the two of them got together and, you know, at late at night and came up with a way to save Social Security. And, and they made some changes. They increased the amount of money that uh, they took out of people's paychecks and they raised the Social Security retirement age and and they started taxing some people on their social security benefits. So they did some things um, in order to make it solvent to get us to where we are today. Well, you know, that was 1980, I don't know, two, 83. And here we are today in 2023, and we're back to the point where we can see the end of social security. So when the president talks about how, you know, some people wanna end social security, if we do nothing, Social Security will end all by itself. Um, and I'm not trying to scare anybody because, you know, our politicians are not going to let that happen. But as, as is written in the Social Security trustee report, the longer they wait to do something, the fewer options they're going to have. And the reality is that the, what they're going to have to do is basically the same thing that what President Reagan and Tip O'Neill did, which is, they're going to have to uh, you know, increase the retirement age. They're potentially going to have to increase the amount of money they take out of our paychecks to pay for Social Security. Um, they potentially are going to have to say, hey, there's some people that maybe you're not going to get Social Security, right? If, if you have a pension that pays you over $100,000 a year, um, you know, uh, you don't maybe get Social Security. And again, elected officials... Um, they're not going to change these rules for people that are currently on Social Security. So don't worry about that. If you're like within, I'd say, 10 years of being uh, eligible for Social Security, you don't really probably have much to worry about because you typically vote and elected officials are not going to take your Social Security and change the, the rules of the road right as soon as you're getting um, to the finish line. But they will say, hey, uh, if you were born in 1996 um, uh, or after, here's the new rule for you, right? You know, um, uh, for all workers, you're going to have to, you know, pay a little more into Social Security. But if you're born after 1996, and I randomly choose that date, and a couple people that watch this update will know why I chose that year. Um, but in any case, uh, they might say, if you're born after 1996, your new retirement age is, you know, or eligibility for collecting Social Security uh, at full retirement is 70 instead of 67. That, that's what they might say. Uh, so uh, Social Security is a real problem. And while the president touched on it and, you know, you know we're going to keep it safe for everybody, you know, it, it's not a fiscally sound program. And We've, we don't have extra money in, in the government, right? We're already running a excess uh, debt, excess deficits, and our debt's you know, rising every year. So something's going to have to be done, um, and, and it's going to have to be done soon because 2034, the next thing you know, it will be right uh, upon us. And, um, and so that's uh, something that, that we're going to be watching but don't anybody who's anywhere within 10 years of, of, re of reaching your Social Security retirement age worry about it, it affecting you. But it will affect like your kids and your grandkids. Um, 
And then the last topic that I wanted to talk about is has nothing to do with either of those two. And the president, I don't even think, touched on it last night. And it's this concept um, of ESG. Now, uh, ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. And it's, um, it's a philosophy that sort of measures how sustainable uh, you know, different businesses are and how green they are, how good for the planet they are, how good for their communities they are. Um, and uh, the president, President Biden, last year, I think it was last year, it might have been 2021, uh, uh, signed an executive order that, that took effect uh, recently that's giving fiduciaries, you know, people like me, people who make decisions about investments, gives fiduciaries uh, the opportunity to use ESG guidelines when making investment decisions. And um, I'm not... I'm not against ESG. I'll, I'll just give you like in, the E, environmental. Um, you know, what's your carbon footprint? Um, you know, we're, we're all concerned about carbon emissions and global uh, climate change. So, you know, uh, the, the lower your, uh, your uh, carbon footprint, you know, the, the better E score you might get. Well, but here's the thing. Last year, the stock market was, was not good. Unless it was oil stocks. Oil stocks did pretty well in general, but oil stocks get really low E scores in the ESG ratings. So my concern with what uh, the, the Biden administration has done is that they're, you know, as a fiduciary, I'm, I'm legally obligated to only do what's in my client's best interest. And with this executive order, what the president has done is he's now opened up the door for me and people like me to make decisions not necessarily based on what's in the client's best interest, but what we think is in the planet's best interests. And it, it again, not that ESG is bad and not that we all shouldn't care about you know, what's good for the planet, but I think that what would be better is to give people the choice, right? I have several clients who, who uh, want things that have really, really high ESG scores and, and they, they don't want to own oil stocks, right? And, but they're informed. They, they are making that choice that there might be some investments that would make them potentially more money, but they don't want to own them because they don't think that they're good for the planet. That's their choice. Um, what the Biden administration has done is that they've put a, a situation in place where fiduciaries don't necessarily have to tell investors that they're avoiding stocks that might make them more money in favor of things that are better for the planet. And I don't think that's a good idea. Um, I think that, that, that and, and, and I think it actually you know, causes many investors to not make the kind of money that they need to make to retire when they want to retire because they're not informed about whether the investments that are being selected for them uh, are being selected because they're best for them, they're gonna make them the most money, or because they're best for the planet and will make them the, as much money as can be made given the ESG you know, criteria. So I'm gonna watch this one pretty closely. Now I'm not obligated to uh, use an ESG rating and I frankly don't, un unless a client specifically tells me I only wanna own things that are good for the planet, um, then I look at investments for which ones make the most money. That's that. That's my filter. That's the that's the ultimate objective, but not everybody's doing that. And my biggest gripe is that not everybody's disclosing that they're not doing that. So I'm watching this in all the funds and and any funds that that, that I might use. I'm checking to make sure that they're using the math of which can make the most money, versus the math of which can make the most money within the confines of an ESG score that might say that you're better for the planet. So you don't get to make any money, but you're good for the planet. Or you might make less money and you're good for the planet. Now, uh, just to be clear, not all ESG investments, um, you know, all, always make less money than non-ESG, you know, favorable investments. I'll give you one example. When the federal government decides that it wants to throw money at solar companies, um, then, you know, solar companies are going to make huge profits and so solar companies become good things to invest in. But 
in comparison to you know what uh, fossil fuels can do uh, and where solar is right now pretty much fossil fuels from a profit standpoint are always going to you know left left uh, without government support fossil fuels are going to win that you know win that race you know nine times out of ten so in any case it, again not that ESG is bad not that all ESG investments are bad uh, it's just I'm concerned about the lack of disclosure that fiduciaries are now sort of allowed to have um, when making decisions on behalf of, of their clients. So anybody who's watching this video, you know, talk to your advisor, talk to your investment manager, you know, just make sure that they're you know, not using investments that are contrary to your you know, risk tolerance and investment objectives and instead doing things that they think are just better for the planet because that's what they want to do. Uh, so, covered quite a bit of uh, information there. Uh, it's been a little while since I've done an update. Uh, you know, the markets had a good January, so I figured, you know, I'd just, you know, I'd just give you a break. Uh, so, that was your update. If anybody has any questions about this or anything that I've talked about or any other financial matter, you know, please just post a, post a message here, send me an email, give me a call. Um, I'm, I, I answer any question that anybody has if they're willing to ask it. So that was your update. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give us a like, give us a share, and I'll be back again soon with another Uncommon Sense update. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to be the first to hear of more Uncommon Sense updates like these, please click the subscribe button below. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks again.